for the documentary series Researchers and Their Fields, 24 interviews with academics from Tilburg University were recorded. The interviews focused on the choices researchers make. What is high quality research and how do they strive to meet these criteria? To what extent do they engage with practice and theory to ground their work? What inspires and frustrates them? This documentary presents the interviewees' views on their role in the research. Are they participants or outside observers? Are the conclusions of their work objective or would a replication yield different outcomes? Can you describe your research to me? Yes, I have a position in philosophy and I've been focusing recently on the nature of the humanities, so a kind of overarching project about the different disciplines and trying to understand what kind of discipline or cluster of disciplines the humanities are. Uh, that has resulted in a manuscript for a book, which I'm finalizing. And what is specific about the humanities? Uh, I think it's, to some extent, the kind of parallel to other forms of, of science, scholarship, um, finding out about things, uh, knowledge. Uh, there is something to be known in historical research, for instance, finding out about archives or in uh, philological text oriented research, finding out about details about how the text originally was, how it has changed over time. Uh, but there is also a side of this, this objective side of the humanities, there is also the person involving side, um, for instance philosophy, that you're thinking about your thinking, that there is something uh, circular about it, um, that you are making arguments about what are good arguments, uh, that there is something which is not and, and that's not a kind of research that you can do by by going out to an archive. That's more introspective, more uh, reflection on your own assumptions and of course those you see in others. But primarily it's it's very much focused on, on the intellectual side itself rather than on the outside world. But the researcher is also a person. Uh, the researcher is a person and of course that's that's true as well in, in physics or anything, but here it, that's more significant in that uh, for two reasons. The person might bring his own personal preferences to the research and that's, that's a risk as well that may introduce all kinds of bias, but it's also a kind of engagement. Uh, and the researcher is a person and thereby might, uh, well, might be to some extent also on the same level as those who are studied, uh, interacting with those. Uh, people in a culture learn about what people think about them. I've seen examples in, for instance, religious studies where communities that were studied um, then learn something about themselves. Uh, for instance, that certain texts were older than other texts, and then those texts that scholars discovered that were older became also religiously more significant. There's no particular reason why it happens, but it, it, it influenced how those people were understanding their own tradition. But then the, the researcher affects, through his engagement with the, um, with the, the group that he observes, affects the, um, what happens in that group? That may and well be the case. Uh, of course, uh, in that, th so that you don't have humans in a sense, uh, the, the parallel, say if it were extraterrestrial studying humans, uh, it would be like zoology. It could be l like a biologist studying uh, some, some animal species or botany uh, studying plants, and the plants don't hear what you're saying about them. But uh, that kind of, of neutrality is, is something to aspire for in many contexts, but it's also not, not purely a given because People who are uh, studied uh, for their personal convictions, well, both morally, they, they deserve to be treated as, as humans. They're not just objects of study. And also intellectually or personally, they, they interact with what they, they think the other is thinking about them. And should the researcher then aspire to, uh, to, to leave the object that he studies untouched? Uh, 
It, it differs very much within the humanities. I mean, if you're studying texts, of course you want to respect just a, what the text is. But what the text means uh, is, to some extent, you can be a historian saying, well, what does it mean to the people who were the or original audience of the text, uh, to, for whom the author was writing? Uh, in that sense, you try to, to step back and be as, as objective as a historian can be. Uh, but we also have an interest in saying, well, but the kind of message that that text has, uh, is that a message that's relevant for us? And that kind of discussion is more philosophical one, where, where you are, uh, well, not looking objectively, but trying to make more uh, an argument about what's a justified belief, what is, what might be true, but true maybe uh, too too much, but what is, uh, what can we take serious? And in, in studying, for example, arguments or text, the researcher produces arguments or texts him or herself as well. That suggests an almost circular process where then future generations of researchers research the research on the original material. Yes. What well, to some extent, this circularity is, I think, typical of, of the humanities. Uh, some parts are more objective. Uh, linguistics may be more objective, just seeing what words are used and so on. But especially when you get more to cultural studies, philosophy, uh, there is this circularity of understanding, trying to understand uh, humans, but yourself being a human, trying to understand also your own understanding and your own biases. And uh, there is a self-involving side to that. Do you also participate in your research or are you an outside observer? Oftentimes, ethnographers would participate in the activities that they observe, but that also really depends on the, the, the study that you're conducting. Sometimes it's also less, uh, um, sometimes it's even also more difficult to participate. So there are different types of ethnography, basically. Uh, the participatory type and the non-participatory type, where you're just an outside observer. Um, whether you participate in people's activities can uh, depend on a number of different factors. So, for instance, in the, uh, the, the case of uh, conspiracy theorists, what you see is that sometimes people are very willing to talk to researchers, other times they are very suspicious of researchers, and therefore it's, it's difficult for you to become a participant. So it also depends on the, the case that at hand, how people will react to the pres presence of the researcher. But the, um, the, the subjects are aware of them being observed. Well, I, this is specific to digital ethnography, which I specialize in, so um, studying online environments, for example. And in traditional ethnography, people would always be aware of the fact that they are being observed. In online environments, that n that's not always a clear cut. So if you have the type of data that can be considered to be public, so there is no breach of privacy, uh, for instance, when people have the explicit aim to be public and have their views publicized, as is the case, for instance, with the conspiracy theorists that I study, then you can make the claim uh, that it's publicly available data that you can just observe without informing uh, the people themselves. And the same goes for celebrities, for instance, or other public figures. You said that you ask your participants what they do to their body. Um, no, no, not what they do to their body, but well, I always <laughs> say if you want to ask the question how people experience their body, so, like, if that's that's is, is if that's say a research question uh, in a sub sub uh, study, you never have m asked that question because if I ask you, so how do you experience your body? That's an odd question, you know. That's that's that's. So then I will always always ask you. So can you describe to me uh, how your day looks like and wh what kind of physical activities you do? Um, so then, so it's more about physical activities, physical interactions, etc., that you ask. And then you can, it's an indirect way of asking people how they experience their body. Because if they talk about physical activities and they feel that they are, um, these are hampered or uh, by something, th that gives you more information about how people feel about, well, experience their body. But one project was about uh, breast reconstructions. 
and the research in that project, she wanted to uh, interview women that um, had, were on the waiting list for uh, a breast reconstruction. And so the plastic surgeons, they all wanted to uh, collaborate with that. Um, but what happened then, um, there was one woman who was willing to participate in this research interview and then she was put on top of the waiting list. So there you see that it's really, and this was of course well, what happened. So she was low on the list, but because she said, well, okay, uh, I want to participate in this research. Uh, and, and the surgeons, they, they really wanted to collaborate with us, with our research. So they, they put her on top of the list. And you can say, well, this is, this is not very ethical, you know. But of course, we as researchers, we couldn't do anything about that. But this kind of things happen. And you do engage with patients who yeah. suffer from real diseases, yes. which yep. yeah. uh, you interact with them. Yeah, yeah. And, and therefore, of course, if you work with patients, it's always very important to get um, um, ethical approval from the, the, the ethical uh, uh, review board. Th these are always um, um, based in hospitals. But even the, 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 the example I gave you, this, this was not something that was mentioned earlier by the, the review board or something. It was really something also new for us. Like, oh, what's happening here? But, uh, yeah. What do these procedures with the review board entail? So what, are, what are they concerned about? Um, of course, in the medical uh, world, first of all, there is also this law. Uh, it's Dutch, it's WMO. Um, and the WMO uh, law is um, um, when you do research with human subjects and you like um, you well you you put something in humans or <laughs> you get something out of them, say with needles and stuff. Um, so anything, then you uh, then you are, um, have to act according to that law. Um, but when you only do like interviews, so it's uh, when it's non-invasive, like the oh well, non-invasive, you're doing interviews. Um, so then it's um, your proposal will be um, um, evaluated according to non-WMO uh, law. But then still there are quite some 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 rules. Um, and of course, what is very important, if you do interviews, um, you have to anonymize uh, your data um, because people, of course, they share a lot of uh, personal information. Um, of course, the infor informed consent, uh, you first inform a person about uh, what the research is about and also that the person can always stop whenever he or she wants, um, that you have to store your data on a safe place. Um, but also um, the ethical review board also wants always to have, say, like um, um, if, for instance, uh, people feel not well after an interview because you have talked about, say, very sensitive issues, which in, in my case is very often the case because we always ask about the body. So there are a lot of issues uh, also, for instance, about sexuality or uh, loss or all these kind of things. So, so people sometimes they start crying or, you know, they don't feel well. And uh, so then the ethical review board wants to know whether you then can refer your uh, your respondent to someone like a psycho psychologist or a counselor or something. So there should be someone involved if you know if people have the um, um, yeah the need for that. And what is also important is, but it's also a general thing, if you work with patients, that it's um, that you do not share the data as such with the doctors, with the clinicians, because also that it should not interfere with the treatment. No. But and but in the example I gave you, there's something went wrong. Yes. Although we couldn't help it. Yeah. 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 But still. Um, um, you could also affect the treatment through your communication with the patient. Yes, absolutely. And what also f uh, sometimes happens is that um, um, uh, also in, in the, 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 the study about the breast cancer, so then you talk with women after breast cancer, um, even if you explain three times, I'm a researcher, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor, that people 
still see you as a therapist or something and that they also um, but most of the time it's it's not it's not bad because they they feel like oh I had a nice conversation with you as if it's like a therapeutic yeah. so it, but I think that's kind of maybe a positive side effect yeah. Um, yeah, some I think was was also in the breast reconstruction study that uh, one woman she refrained from from the surgery because because of the talk she had with the with the researcher. So that that happens, yeah. But yeah. But the moments peop you sit with people, the moments they are willing to answer your questions, the sky is the limit. Very often they start, well, I, uh, I'm pressed for time and I have only half an hour and, and in the end it's always me who end the interview. <laughs> so it's always, I always said, well, I think that was everything, thank you very much. Because if you give people a lot of attention, then they'll open up. They always do. But the, that comes with a enormous responsibility on the side of the researcher if people yes. are willing to pretty much answer any question that you would yeah. ask them. Yeah, you have a lot of responsibility and you have to be aware of that. And what, what kind of guiding rules do you then apply? Uh, well, you can, you can ask difficult questions but the the one the the person that is interviewed should not should not be driven into a crisis or something so you stay away from that and there are as far as i know no hard rules for that but that is something you do and this is your skill as an interviewer yeah i think it is. So you, you have to push a bit, of course, and I do. So I know it's unbearable for us humans if we are silent. If we are silent now for, let's say, five seconds, it's unbearable for you, it's unbearable for me, and it will be unbearable for somebody who watches. But if I interview people, I, and I ask a difficult question, and a respondent goes, well, I don't know, I don't know, it's difficult, I don't know, I wait. And then always something comes up. But So you push, but never too far. Will, they, uh, will participants not confuse you with a therapist or, some, uh, or a psychologist who, who is able to help them? Yeah, that happens a lot. And I always tell them, I'm not a psychiatrist, and they need to see a psychotherapist or whatever for certain questions. So I tell them. But you know, especially the title, now it says Professor Doctor, but when I interviewed them, it was Doctor. And very often they took me for a GPA or something. So when I came in, especially for cosmetic surgery, sometimes people started to undress. They said, well, I'll show you what I... And I said, no, 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 <laughs> it's not about this. Uh, so uh, you have to be very clear and you have to explain. And you also explain, I will interview you, um, this will be published, but never in a way that you can be recognized. I tape all this, this is what I do with the tape. This, and you have to explain because people don't know. They just don't know. And very often they don't even realize. So I never cut across someone who said, hey, what are you going to do with the tape anyway? Or they don't ask, but you have to tell them. So it's anonymity is not really something that they care about, but no. more of a protection mechanism. Yeah, you have to protect them. Also against themselves sometimes. I mean, if people want to undress in front of me, I have to protect them. Of course I have. That's my responsibility. Now, I, I understand that the researcher is quite close to the subject of his or her research um, in ethnography. Um, how do you then kind of take care that the, that the, the subjective element doesn't um, 
that doesn't doesn't influence the in the results yes that's a very interesting question depending on the topic of course um, there can be uh, differences in terms of how close uh, the the researcher is to the to the topic. So sometimes, if you study very familiar uh, environments that are very familiar to you, um, that can of course be very different from studying an environment that uh, is entirely new to you. What ethnographers try to do is uh, exercise reflexivity. So, as much as possible, account for your own biases and be aware of the kinds of beliefs and ideas uh, and biases that you might have towards the the, the topic and and people that you study. But that is difficult to be aware of your own um, biases in your in your analyses. That, that is very difficult indeed. But then there are mechanisms to make sure, like for instance, triangulation, which is used a lot in ethnography. So meaning that you can, uh, and there are different types of triangulation. So you can use data triangulation, for instance. So you collect different kinds of data from different contexts to make sure that the things that you observe um, occur I I in many contexts, in many, in many types of data, so it's not just um, one, off, a one off thing that you observe. You can use researcher triangulation, where you have not just one person, but a number of researchers looking at the data. And that's another way of ensuring that it's not just your own biases that, you're, uh, that are being reflected in your analysis. No one could argue <coughs> that if, if the data that you collect hinges on who is collecting the mm. data, mm. then that is something that you want to get out of the research in the end in order to be able yeah. to build on that. Yeah, but then you kind of, the, but I think, you know, um, so if, if it was not Darwin who went in this boat, but someone else, you know, would we have had the same theory? You know, that's, no, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, um, the, the of course, there's always this, idea of objective research, yeah? but uh, th in the humanities, ma but maybe even in physics, I mean, there's always the role of the researcher, or maybe even in physics even more than in the humanities, because, you know, in, 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 in like in quantum mechanics, then, then it's, it's exactly the, the moment of measurement that determines uh, which position, uh, say, the, the electron takes, but so, so the, 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 the um, you cannot just presume that you can do science or research and uh, as if the, the, um, the characters, characteristics of a researcher does not play a role. I think that's, that's naive. I do think that there uh, are uh, specific positions from which you start your, uh, your uh, observations and your analysis. Uh, and it does make a difference if you are using this or that theoretical frame. Yeah? So, so therefore, the research is open for discussion. However, I would not, never say that that everything that you do in culture studies or in uh, in liter literature studies is subjective. Yeah? So that everything, uh, uh, let's say, there, uh, let's go, let's say everything because you are your own, you are making your own arguments. So there always is also a debate in which you are positioning yourself. There are peers, there are other researchers that are working on the same topic. And that again is a conversation, is something that you do together in a team maybe even with, uh, with researchers. Uh, so it is never like, okay, I am Odila Henders, I say this and that about literature and that's it. It's always um, yeah, a dialogue, a conversation. So the objectivity arises from um, multiple subjective analysis of the si yeah. similar material. Yeah, I do not believe in ultimate objectivity. I do not believe in ultimate subjectivity. I think uh, what uh, is important in, in academia is that we have discussions and conversations. And the best you can aim for is intersubjectivity. That we agree, okay, you are building this argument, I can follow you, I can see your data, I can see your theoretical perspectives. I'm convinced that this is a clear and interesting argument. That is how it works. Can you tell me what your research is about? Yes, well, um, uh, let's say I do research on a broad spectrum of topics. Uh, 
let's say one uh, possible umbrella to um, think about everything that I'm doing is uh, to say that I do research about social purpose organizations. Uh, this has uh, translated in research about healthcare organizations, uh, for example, the relationship with healthcare systems. Uh, we studied extensively um, the influence of policy changes of uh, you know healthcare policy level both in the Netherlands and in Italy on uh, uh, strategies and cooperative behaviors of uh, healthcare organizations and uh, i would say my research is, has been increasingly mixed method so with qualitative part and quantitative part to and i believe there's value in it because what you often do with regression analysis is you know you test a relationship why the re that relationship is there you really don't know you can hypothesize from theory uh, but oftentimes it's very useful to really have the experience of practitioners uh, to be able to explain the mechanisms that you that underpin the relationship that you are you have tested and then the qualitative research follows mm -hmm. the, the quantitative patterns that you observed? Um, I yes, it depends. So sometimes uh, you sort of have a relationship in mind, you have tested that relationship, and you go in the field as a qualitative, with qualitative um, methods to gather the perspective of the practitioner about that specific relationship. So it's really deductive sort of qualitative work. Other times uh, we go in the field with a really open-minded, so with a more grounded theory approach. And there you emerge yourself or immerse yourself really in the field and you try to abstract slowly, slowly uh, relationships from the field. So it's really inductive then because you use a grounded theory approach and slowly, slowly move from the empirical level to the theoretical one. Uh, sometimes it is a combination, so sometimes it's what we call abductive approach. So you have already some categories and some relationships in mind, and you use uh, the uh, experience of practitioners from the field to sort of uh, uh, fill in the categories that you have in mind, explain the relationship that you have in mind, but also possibly add to those. So yes, it's a bit of a combination of the two. Seems difficult to factor out the researcher in that research to, um, to, to make it something that is objectifiable. Hmm. What is objectifiable? Sometimes, no. uh, sometimes, you know, especially when we do qualitative research, we do take a social constructivistic uh, approach. So it is, uh, and by that we mean that, you know, there's no unified objective view of what a construct is, what a relationship is. It is very much context dependent and also time dependent. So you see that a specific construct is uh, developed by the interaction of people within that specific community, within that specific group, at that specific point in time. So if you go in the same community later on, that construct or that relationship might be perceived in a completely different way. Or if you go in a different community, their understanding and their sense making of that specific contract or relationship might be completely different. So in that sense, uh, uh, we don't seek for objective, uh, let's say, truth at that point. Uh, we do seek for the localized understanding of that. In, and in that sense, we completely uh, give up any hope uh, or even an intent of generalizability. Oftentimes we, you know, we hear uh, reviewers um, or scholars asking, okay, to what extent is your result uh, uh, qualitative findings generalizable to other settings? Well, that's really not what we're looking for at that point with that type of research. But if, if each and every finding is relevant to the context in mm -hmm. which it was found, and may not generalize beyond mm -hmm. that, then how do you move further as a field? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I think, um, uh, I think uh, you can then uh, sort of uh, collect the different findings uh, um, and um, you know, try to understand then the role of the context. So you would have different conceptualization of the same construct. I don't know, I'm just, while I'm talking to you, I'm just thinking about the concept of social entrepreneurship, because just yesterday we were talking about, you know, the process of sense making of social entrepreneurship in the education sector in South Africa. And then you see the stakeholders came together over time, 
they slowly, slowly came up with this concept of social entrepreneurship. And then because of their local license making, this has also, uh, has also been institutionalized at a regulatory level because that has become essentially a legal form. Um, now, that specific process might have worked in a completely different way, in a different setting. But then, as a researcher, you can abstract uh, one level up uh, to see the role of context uh, in driving the different processes of sense making. That you can do, possibly. Uh, and that, I, I believe, can, can provide an advancement to the field. Is, is the study of values, is science free of values itself? Is science free of values itself? Um, well, if we study, for instance, um, like like, so, uh, if we study people based on on, on survey research, um, it's really difficult to uh, well, you, you analyze those data, and the responses are what they are. I mean, often we, we let data speak to, to ourselves. Uh, if this is what we find, well, then it is what we find. But yeah, we're, we're human beings. Um, so often uh, the data is not black or white. The results we find should also be interpreted in line with, with the theories that we actually, actually have. Um, value free. I think to a large extent uh, we're value free, but not, yeah, the research is, is not always that, that black or white. Keep in mind that if you do a study and you, do, you collect data and you do a quantitative analysis of those data, of some statistical model, that there's many, many decisions that need to be made in how to pre-process the data, on which, which control variables to include, about how to personalize, how to determine in your analysis the outcome variable, the key thing of interest, the measure that you've taken. There's many, many decisions in a statistical analysis that need to be made. It's very likely that if, if a researcher doesn't find anything in the first analysis of many possible analyses, if you will, that he or she might feel, hey, maybe there's something wrong with how I set up the analysis. Maybe I should go and look more closely at the data. Maybe I should try another analysis or maybe kick out some outliers or, or try something else in a, in a very um, um, honest way looking for patterns in the data and then finding something right which which might look interesting and i think it might be um, but the problem is if you go and search in the data you will always find something so the statistical evidence there becomes very very weak becomes weak as you look more in the data the same data set that you keep on analyzing you will always find something and there's no doubt that this, this lowers the evidence and this is a problem that is wi now being widely recognized. It's often called significance chasing because people want to find something significant. It's also called p-hacking, referring to the p-value that's often of interest in, in significance testing. And there's no doubt that if you look in any data long enough, you always find something. So the implication is that the, the the, the chance of finding something that's a complete statistical fluke, just a random error or false positive, is very high if you do that. So there's, there's no doubt that if you go and search for results, you always find something and that most of the evidence is weak. Then another problem is that even if, if the researcher were right, so there might be an effect of the treatment for depression, if you will, um, that by analyzing the data differently in different ways and selecting the most desirable outcome, that you would then inflate the effect. It still then would be a biased outcome. It, it would be, it would appear to be better than it actually is. So these are two, two ways in which the literature can be off. One, too many false positive findings or false findings in the literature. Or if the researcher is right, somehow the effects publi as published are, are inflated or biased. So researchers, in an honest effort to fix what they think are errors in their own research and actually do harm to science? They might, unwillingly. I mean, they, they, they try to understand what's going on. So I completely understand why they're looking for patterns in the data. It's, it's, it's in a way, it's part of our job description. Although the problem is that the, the statistical way that they approach it, the testing, the p-values and whatnot, are used inappropriately. And, and this is a problem because if m many people do this in science, 
many results might not be trustworthy. And we need to deal with that somehow. Do you have any idea how you so could deal with it? The, the idea is, is a, as simple as it could be. The idea is that you, if you have a, a study that seeks to test a particular hypothesis with a particular type of data collection, that you specify what you're going to do in advance. That you specify, okay, this is the, the hypothesis that I'm aiming for. Not all the other ones that might be interesting, but this is the one that I put my bets on. Because I have good prior beliefs that this might be right. So the hypothesis is stipulated in advance, but so is the analysis plan. You can pre-register in a pre-registration precisely what you're going to do. And then you collect the data. Only then that you collect the data and then apply that single analysis script that would yield an unbiased estimate of what you aimed for detecting and what you try to, to estimate as an effect. And, um, and this is the unbiased way to do it. It's called pre-registration. Um, and then the study becomes much, the results will be become much more trustworthy. There's a, there's a trend, I'm not sure how recent it is, in, uh, in the social sciences to, uh, to replicate other people's uh, work. Yeah. And that has led to um, some interesting um, disconfirmations um, over the past. How do you feel about this type of work? Yeah, so I think replications are really important. So um, there, for a while, it was the case that um, somebody would do a study, and other people might follow up on it, but they would do their own twist to it. And, um, and then they would publish things that when they do their own twist and it works, um, so they find something similar, then they kind of get published. If you do the, your own twist and then it doesn't work, it doesn't really get published. And in part because it's hard to know why it doesn't work. Is it because of your own twist or is it because the theory is not right or, or what's going on? Um, and then maybe in the last, I guess, uh, 10 years or so, a little bit less than that, um, people are becoming much more um, forceful about saying, okay, if we have a study, we need to do it again um, at least once, if not five, six, ten more times um, to understand how robust that effect is. Because any, any study that you run ha could not work in the future just for reasons of chance. Um, because this is all probabilistic type things. You might just have a sample that you kind of, um, you know, in one experimental condition, just all the, well, right people ended up in that <laughs> condition and mm. caused your effect. And if you do it again, random chance will lead to a different result. It's part of the reason we want to do these a lot. Um, I think this is really important because it gives a sense of what seems to be the most consistent results. Um, if you do enough of them, you can know if it's how consistent it is within one particular lab at one university um, compared to a you know, replications within a country to different countries and so on. So you get a sense of how stable these things are. I think that's really useful for building theories on. So I'd much rather build a theory on something that is stable than is something that moves around a lot mm -hmm. from time to time. Um, and I think it gives us good information about what theories are likely to be true or not, because there's been there's a variety of theories that um, ended up, as we're finding out, um, based on studies that didn't replicate well and were not or were really hard to replicate because the, the effects were really flimsy and um, small and prone to kind of minor variations in the experimental procedure. Um, when you're talking about uh, experiments on on people, well. Life is full of minor variations, and if your theory can't survive minor variations, it's unclear how that's going to make a difference outside this. Um, and so I think these things have helped us kind of figure out a little bit more what are the theories that we should put more attention on because they seem to be making robust predictions that hold across time a bit more. But wouldn't you then say um, that replications are required because um, original research is too much open to minor variations? So that, that rather than, is, is this not remedying um, um, original work that should have remedied these, uh, these issues, or is there more to it? Yeah, so I think um, replications are, are important to, no matter the, the robustness or the, the quality of the original study, um, because random chance can always play a role, um, even in the best conducted studies. Um, and I think it's useful to just even know when to if a different lab does the same study if they're getting similar results or not. Um, it's just it's almost impossible to know that without doing it. Um, that that said, um, I I personally am you know 
so we, we have this paper which we, where we outline what are the things that make for a high quality replication of original papers. Um, and I think we basically give good advice in this paper. Um, some people have criticized their paper because they're like, yeah, but all of those suggestions apply to original research too. And they're mm -hmm. totally right. It's just not the paper we were writing. If we were writing a paper for how to do high quality original research, a lot of those things would be in that paper too. Um, I would, if we can have solid science on the original studies, solid science on the replications, that's, that's I think where we should, yeah. should head. Um, and uh, do what we can to take care of these different variations and methodological shortcomings on the original research, do high quality studies there. I think they'll be more likely to replicate, but that's an empirical question. Now, I wonder, social scientists, um, you say have an object that is outside of them, and that is what they, uh, what they study. So there's something out there that is real. Yeah. Um, and they develop theories about um, how these objects rela relate to other objects, or how, the, uh, how they behave if, yeah. it, if it would be a human object. And they, uh, you, s um, you suggest that as soon as you do that, um, your own ideas, um, your own interpretation of the object matter. What does that say about the um, about the standpoint that you can actually, in social science, build an objective body of knowledge? Well, the fact uh, no, I think it's very simple. So, of course, you can have a, an objective fact that's that's true. But what is an objective fact? An objective fact is uh, is determined by the theory that makes it an objective fact. So, the objective fact is not an objective fact. In itself, this is the example of the Copernical revolution of Kant. So it's there's not a sunset. This, the sun is not going under. There's not an objective fact. It is has something to do with my relationship to it. Okay, then the sci scientist can say, well, okay, that's a philosophical problem. I don't care, but I want to study the sunset, whatever it is. Uh, and of course, you can uh, you can make theories, and you can have a very good purpose uh, to do that. I well, for in this example, I do not know exactly what the purpose would be, but we we want to uh, uh, help people that are suffering, suffering from diseases. We are suffering from mental diseases or uh, in political situation, etc. There might be very good reasons to say well. Okay, that might be true, but I have an objective fact here to study. Uh, and that's the thing that is, uh, uh, it is, if you see the th truth, if you see something which you say this is true, this is objective, I've reached here a point, then this is also uh, always already done by the theory, well, it proves a theory. And I think scientists, are, some philosophers are very critical about scientists. I'm not critical about scientists, I want to lay stress on the difference between them. But, but I think most scientists are, are, very, uh, are, uh, are very fair in that. They will say, okay, there is, of course there's a theory and there is an objective truth because of the theory, but that, that's not a problem. <laughs>